once more with feeling, and Emily Clark will be lighting our flaming chalice. There is a business management consultant named Jim Cathcart, and he developed what he calls the ACORN principle. He says, a lot of managers look at that little acorn that they see inside somebody, and they say, acorn, I think you've got potential. I think with a little training and a little hard work, you could be a giant redwood. Then this misled manager says, Acorn, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to work with you to help develop your redwood skills. Here's a tape I want you to listen to called The Power of Positive Redwood Thinking by Dr. Norman Vincent Tree. Here's a book on the history of some of the great redwoods of all time. Learn from their example. I'd also like you to start networking with redwoods. Just take a redwood to lunch, find out what they're like, and ask them their secrets. I also want you to say a daily affirmation I've written for you. It says, I am a redwood, great and tall. My mighty branches shelter all. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it, people like me. And then once in a sermon, I added this, how many of us have been told by parents, by teachers, by those in authority, oh no, you can't possibly be that, you're this. Boys and girls alike held hostage to absurd stereotypes and expectations, 
Everybody in our family goes to college. Nobody in our family doesn't want to get married. What do you mean you're a gay, cowboy, transgender, person of color, humanist, but still rather traditionally liberal, Christian, Unitarian, Universalist, polyamorous, Republican minister? <laughs> now we're going to sing a hymn. We tried to sing a couple of weeks ago, and we did it rather poorly. And yet it's a good hymn. And so we're going to do this hymn until we get it right. And here to give us instructions is Brad Connor. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, there we go. If you're going to sing, you better get ready. So um, everyone needs to have the teal hymnal. Do you have a teal hymnal? If you don't, could you let the ushers know? They'll bring you one. And it's 51. It's page 51 in the teal hymnal. Or 105. I know. It's, you're being very literal. 1051. It's 51. Um, so I'm going to give you the roadmap for how this works so that you know. The first two lines. You've got the first two lines. You sing them, then you sing them again. Then you go to the bottom line of that first page, and then you do page two, and then you do page three, and you go to the end of that third line, see that little mark there? And you go back to the bottom line of the first page. You lost yet? Yes. Good. What, what little mark there? See the little mark at the end of the third line, bottom of the third page, does everybody else see it? John can't see it, but there it is, see? There you go. And then you're going to go back to the bottom line of the first page, and then you sing two again, then you sing three, then you go over and sing four, and then you've got that last line. Just keep singing until the music stops. And watch the choir.
much better. <laughs> Together, we join in the words of our unison affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and love, and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta iglesia, y el servicio es su ley. Este es nuestro gran pacto, vivir juntos en paz, buscar la verdad en el amor, y ayudarnos los unos a los otros. So be it. Good morning. And welcome to First Parish in Bedford, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. This is a place where we come together to try to actually nourish the acorns and many other seeds inside each of us and to help each other grow into our very best unique selves together. And so to that end, we invite you to bring your full self here, all of who you are and what you believe, all of what is on your heart and mind, so that you may be fully present and grow more full. Today, after the service, we will be having a conversation about the future of staffing for our religious education program. And so if you are interested in learning about some ideas that the board has around how we can shape our staff structure here at the church, I really encourage you to come um, and join with us at noon in here, I believe. And then next Sunday after the service, we will have the first of our Trans Inclusion in Congregations course from the Transforming Hearts Collective. It's a video course that has both a video component and in-person discussion with others from the congregation, so please do consider coming to that so that we can add to that um, ability to bring our full selves here. And then I also want to let you know that the Peace and Justice Committee will be doing postcard signings to our legislators at the community hour, and these will be to support the Safe Communities Act, which is designed to protect immigrants in our communities by keeping local law enforcement and federal immigration enforcement separate. Um, and these will be delivered to legislators in October. And then one last announcement, former student Laura Fell Schulten will be in church today. She is in church, I hope, perhaps. Uh, this was sent to me in the past, so it said tomorrow, but in fact it's today. <laughs> Um, and would like it to be known that she's helping organize the Harvest Fair at the Carlisle UU Church on October 5th. I think that's Saturday, so you can check that out. Without further ado, we'll move on to our rest of our service. You know, it's been a while since we've had a uh, ceremony of child dedication. There seems to be a uh, new spirit of fertility coming in this congregation, which is good news because we've got a couple of kids and families to welcome uh, this morning, and I'm particularly inviting right now to have the Neals come forward as well as the Rios and whoever you're having stand up with you as well. I usually explain that this is a ceremony. Come on up, and, and this is a very highly choreographed thing. <laughs> and you kind of face people so that they can see what's going on. And this ceremony goes by many names in every culture and religious tradition. It can be a baptism, a christening, a naming service, a dedication. Sometimes I refer to it as a rust proofing. <laughs> Essentially, there are two meanings that go with this service. First of all, we simply don't let the birth of a child go unnoticed. We don't take children for granted. 
we stop whatever we're doing and we say, ah. And I'll get to you in a second, Zachary, but you know, here we've got a littlest one, and what we do when we see littlest ones is we say, ah, <laughs> one, two, three, ah. ah. <laughs> now, Zach is, is five years old, and what? <laughs> Almost five years old. Almost five. And, and Rebecca chose to have this ceremony a little later because Rebecca remembers when she was dedicated in this church by Jack Mendelssohn a number of years ago, and she wanted to wait so that Zach could have some memory of this as well. And with Zach, when we have a kid this age, we say, yay! And so, one, two, three. Yay! <laughs> this is a daring public ritual. This sacrament acknowledges that the church welcomes the disconcertingly strange, the disconcertingly strange, the disconcertingly strange, <laughs> and the future in all of its squirming uncertainty into our life. This sacrament asks parents to relax their obsessive hold on their child for their children are beyond their final reach and control. As the poet Khalil Gibran has said, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. And so the second universal meaning to this ceremony is that these children are born not only to the care of their parents and their immediate family and friends, but it takes a village to raise a child. And so there is an invisible bond of commitment, a covenant that is being made between you and these families. They are saying to you, in effect, they are asking for your engagement with their lives. Another way of putting it is that these parents are not to be trusted with their children. <laughs> Behold these children, they come forth with stardust in their hair, with the rush of planets in their blood, with hearts beating out the seasons of eternity, with a shining in their eyes like sunlight, with hands to shape, with that same force that shaped them out of the raw stuff of the universe. From the beginning of time, men and women have brought their children to houses of worship for dedication. In a congregation and a community, children are introduced to their world. Here, they learn to count the number of their days and weigh their meaning, to gather into their minds the wisdom of ancestors, to know why we call one thing right and another thing wrong, to treasure beauty mercy and justice in the deep places of their being. And so I begin by asking Christina and Chris and Rebecca and Tom, as these children's parents, will you help them to realize the best acorn that is in them? Will you seek to the best of your ability to instruct them by your teaching and by your example? And will you, will you love them with an unselfish love? And if you are willing, please say, we will. We will. And I should also take note that the rest of you are up here as sponsors, sometimes called godparents. And the traditional role of godparents is for the religious upbringing of a child. 
And so what this really means is that next Sunday and in future Sundays, <laughs> when Chris and Christina want to sleep in, all they have to do is call you and you'll take over. And, and because the Neils don't have anybody, they may need to call upon you as well. <laughs> so, so thank you for your generosity. First of all, tell me the names you have chosen. What is the name of your daughter? Joelle Virginia Rio. Joelle Virginia Rio. And what is the name of your son? Zachary David Neal. Zachary David Neal. Tell just a little bit of the story behind Joelle and her names. Um, so her middle name is my mother's mother's name, um, and her first name, uh, it doesn't really have a family meaning, but we, we liked, I, I guess we just liked it. <laughs> so we, we incorporated the family part in the middle name. And, and she will hereafter be known, among other things, except when you're angry with her as Jojo. Yep. Correct. Okay. And tell us the story of the name you've chosen for Zachary. Well, we waited until we met him, but we had a short list. And when he was born, he had dark, dark hair. And when I met him, I thought, oh, this is my little Greek boy, because I'm half Greek. And so we chose the name Zachary, which very roughly in Greek means sugar. So he's sweet. <laughs> and his middle name is David, which is after his uh, grandfather on Tom's side. Wonderful. And so. with water, which is water that we gathered on In Gathering Sunday, and with a flower, which is a symbol of unfolding life, I touch Joelle by her brow, by her eyes, and by her mouth, that her thoughts and her vision and her speech may be true and clear, and I touch her by her hand, that her actions may be kind and gentle and do good. And I touch her by her heart, that she may love and be loved. That's for you. And here likewise, Zach, I touch you by your brow, <laughs> by your nose, <laughs> by your mouth, by your hands, and by your heart, that your thinking, your breathing, your speech, and your actions may be clear and good and gentle, and I touch you by your heart that you may know love and be loved. And maybe you can hold on to that for your brother. And I am now going to ask Deb to say a few words to the kids of this congregation as well. So friends, it's exciting to be able to be here as part of this gathered community to welcome these new lives, even though some of you may be saying, well, we know Zach, we've, we've had Zach around for a while. Joelle is new to us, but this is a formal way that we are welcoming both of them. And you have a big part in this because it is up to you to make a commitment that we hope you will be able to hold to, that you will be their friends, that you will be gentle and loving with them, you will support them as they grow up. Is that something that you feel like you could participate in and, and do to say how much you care about them? Yes. 
I'm so glad, and you will have that chance not only today, but in all the days to come, where they are part of this congregation and you are as well. So thank you for that. That's how we build this community. But wait, there's more. <laughs> and for Joelle, we have a onesie with a flaming chalice and let your little light shine. And for Zach, we have a T-shirt, side with love. There you go. But you're not off the hook yet because there is a covenant that we say together that has some old and traditional words and you'll find it in your order of service and together I'm going to ask you to stand as you're able and we will read this together. We welcome you into the life of this congregation and we promise you our love and care. We covenant with you that so far as in us lies we will walk with you in the bonds of love and friendship. We will strive to help you fulfill the promise of your life in laughter and in tears, day in and day out. We will strive to do our best to listen to you with compassion and to speak with you in truth. Whatever may come to you in the spirit of our faith, which tells us that love never fails, we promise never to close our hearts against you. With one another as our witness, may we love be steadfast, creative, and abounding. And you may be seated. And so, Joel, Virginia, Rio, and Zachary, David, Neil, we dedicate you to the service of goodness and beauty and truth. Joel and Zachary, we welcome you with love and we rejoice that you are you. Welcome. Why not just give it up and applaud? And there are certificates here too. Certificates here too. And now kids and teachers are going to go off to their classes and we are going to stand as you're able and sing. If you want to sing out, sing out. We did it. I'm Sandy Bosnowski, a member of the Lay Pastoral Care Team. And as a caring community, we pause in our service to share with each other our joys and our concerns. If you'd like to light a candle this morning, please come forward now. And after the service, I'll be by the candle stand if you'd like to light a candle privately. I'm going to light one final candle for those joys and concerns that we keep silently in our hearts. And I'll be by the candle stand after the service if you'd like to light a candle.
you're about to hear a uh, setting of the composition Choose Something Like a Star by Randall Thompson. It's from a collection of Robert Frost poems set to music called Frostiana. And I told the choir that when I was growing up in uh, UU Church, this particular composition was as close to the hit song of UU churches as ever there was. It seemed that every choir would sing compositions from Frostiana. And it's a little bit less favored these days or less heard these days, but it's great to hear it again and I appreciate your willingness to give it your best. And speaking of giving it your best, <laughs> another piece of our covenant is generosity. Freely we have received, freely give, for the good work of this congregation within and far, far beyond these walls, our offering will now gratefully be received.
I'm going to throw one more thing at you. Turn in your hymnals to number 538, 538, Harbingers of Frost, and we will read this together. Together, autumn we know is life en route to death. The asters are but harbingers of frost. The trees flaunting their colors at the sky in other times will follow where the leaves have fallen, and so shall we. Yet other lives will come, so may we know, accept, embrace the mystery of life we hold a while nor mourn that it outgrows each separate self, but still rejoice that we may have our day. Lift high our colors to the sky and give in our time fresh glory to the earth. So, Yes, I will be on sabbatical, October, November, and December. Sue says that the car will leave our driveway early on Tuesday morning, and she hopes that I will be in it. <laughs> we'll be taking a long road trip, first to see our son Eric and his husband George outside of Tucson, Arizona, in the dusty town of Patagonia, population 913. Patagonia is composed of hippies and cowboys and artists. Eric and George are neither cowboys nor artists. The last time I was there, though, I visited the Cowboy Church. That's for real. They have a Cowboy Church. I sauntered up to some crusty old guys, and I said, let me know if you fellas need any help from some big city East Coast liberals. They suggested that I rope some calves. <laughs> I did not. Anyway, we will follow our noses for a few weeks, at least, visit friends and hike. The artist and writer Cheryl Strayed once said, there's always a sunrise and always a sunset, and it's up to you to choose to be there for it. Put yourself in the way of beauty, she said. I hope to put myself in the way of beauty. And I am thankful for the opportunity and know that each and every one of you deserves a sabbatical too. It is not unheard of for our parishioners to occasionally take a sabbatical from this church and we hope come back revived. When we return from our road trip, I plan to practice another great spiritual discipline called decluttering, getting rid of stuff, putting myself in the way of a whole lot of accumulated crap. And then I will be back on December 31st at 11.59 p.m. And out in that narthex, I hope to join some of you in pulling the bell rope to welcome 2020. I know that we as a congregation face uncertainties, just as all of us face uncertainties personally. My being away may cause some of you to rejoice while others' anxieties are raised. We all like to know what's going on, and we all like to be in control. A fundamental spiritual fact is that we don't, and we can't. There is one church issue you'll face in my absence that I want to make sure you know about. Deb, 
you know, is our interim director of religious education, and she will finish in June. The board has been looking at future staffing patterns in consultation with the RE committee, the committee on ministry, and our staff. The board is close to recommending that we have a full-time minister for faith formation, as well as a new three-quarter time assistant director of religious education. The minister will continue to do some preaching and pastoral care, but will focus on faith formation for all ages. The assistant will focus on curriculum selection and deployment, teacher training and support, and administration of our RE program serving children and youth, infant through high school. Currently, we are understaffed, and we believe that this will strengthen our program for all. Moreover, it is possible that Annie can be considered as an inside candidate to be our Minister of Faith Formation, thus giving staff continuity as we face changes over the next few years. This is not a done deal, though Annie is very open to this possibility, and it has my enthusiastic support, and you will have an opportunity for input as soon as today at noon, and again, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now I return to reflecting about what it's like to face the uncertainties of the future. At rites of passage, at child dedications, marriages, coming of age, and memorial service too, the basic message is, who knows what will happen next? A few minutes ago, I said that it takes a village to raise a child and that Christina and Chris, Rebecca and Tom are not to be trusted to raise their kids alone. How can they be? How many times faced with a quandary did Sue and I tell our son Eric, we are doing the very best we can. We've never done this before. At weddings, I often say, love can be like the wind and weather. Sometimes it's hot, sometimes sticky, sometimes cold and calamitous, and sometimes it's perfect. We shall do more, I say than drift with these uneven currents of affectionate feeling. And then, invariably, I tell every couple I marry, you have absolutely no idea what you're getting yourselves into. <laughs> Nor do you, Chris and Christina, Tom and Rebecca. Nor really do any of us. Some of you have heard me tell this story, but on the morning of our ingathering three weeks ago, I was carrying a big plywood Jenga box outdoors, walking that path by our memorial garden from that door to the sidewalk, and as I stepped onto the sidewalk on the common, I was hit by a careening, speeding bicycle. He couldn't see me, and I couldn't see him, but he was two feet from me when I stepped in his way. He fell, but was mostly unhurt. He hit the wooden box I was carrying, which left me black and blue, but mostly unhurt. He and I could have been killed, really. That would have been a bad start to the church year. <laughs> Look both ways when you cross the street. Last week, I was approached by one of our healthy, spry, older parishioners. She is, I will say, superannuated, more than a centenarian but you can't guess who it is because we've got several such centenarians in our midst. She wished me well on my sabbatical, but then a bit wistfully she said, we may never see one another again. She's right, of course. 
I may get thrown from my horse at the cowboy church. But it's not just the superannuated who don't know the future. Last summer, there was an obituary that went viral. Perhaps you saw it. It was for five-year-old Garrett Mathias who died of a rare cancer. He wrote some of his own obituary. Funerals are sad, he said. I want five bouncy houses because I'm five. Batman and snow cones. He said he wanted to be burned and made into a tree so I can live in it when I'm a gorilla. <laughs> and after he died, I am going to be a gorilla and throw poo at daddy. <laughs> he was forever a prankster who teased the doctors and nurses with whoopee cushions and clothespins. He would sneak onto their clothes, his obituary said. And when someone told him, see you later, alligator, he would catch them off guard with, see you later, suckas. <laughs> Part of his obituary was called The Things I Love the Most, playing with my sister, my blue bunny, thrash metal, Legos, my daycare friends, Batman, and when they put me to sleep before they access my port. He was known around the hospital as Garrett Underpants because he hated wearing pants or shorts. One day he said he would be a professional boxer and his name would be the great Garrett Underpants. What I'm trying to say is that all of us, old and young, live amidst constant uncertainty. In religious community, the response to uncertainty is faith and covenant. Turn to your Bibles, <laughs> where in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it is said, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then there's covenant. You've been hearing us talk a lot about covenant because I think covenanting is our way forward as a congregation. Ours is not a dogmatic church or a creedal church. Ours is a covenantal community. We do not promise salvation, nor do we threaten damnation. So much in our consumerist capitalist culture is rule-based or contractual or quid pro quo. You do this and I'll do that. And if you don't, you face the consequences. I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. This is the art of the deal. You give me dirt on Joe Biden and I'll give you some missiles, just for example. The alternative to the art of the deal is the Ark of the Covenant. Do you take this person to be your partner for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse, in sorrow and in joy, to love and to cherish? I do. In the spirit of our faith, which says, Love never fails. We promise never to close our hearts against you. Love is the spirit of this church. These are aspirational. We don't always live up to them, but we try hard. Sometimes I say that covenants are a kind of promise, and I've even said that human beings are the promise-making, promise-breaking, promise-remaking species. But I do appreciate the way that Beyond states its values, which I printed at the top of your order of service. It says, we do not make promises, but we try very hard. Making 
promises, I suppose, can lead to a certain finger pointing when things don't go well. You broke your promise. When we speak of covenants, by contrast, we can be in covenant, we can fall out of covenant, and we can move back into covenant. This, again, is our aspiration. The organization Beyond, the Boston Immigrant Justice Accompaniment Network provides bond money and other services to immigrants, so their values are specific to their mission. But I suggest that we read them together from your order of service and consider how they might even apply to us as a congregation. Together, we honor people's dignity and choices in a system that denies dignity and choice. We expect messiness, confusion, and discomfort, and we also choose courage and trust, and we're gonna read that one again because it is pretty darn crucial. We expect messiness, confusion, and discomfort, and we also choose courage and trust. We judge the system, not people. We fight for one another as family because we are. What I suggest is that each of you in any sort of small group or committee or task force or even as a group of friends, spend some time at your next meeting or gathering if you have not already done so, contemplating the kinds of promises, values, and covenants you would make among yourselves. Hey, even our senior youth group, which in the past had an aversion to covenant making, which they considered a kind of top-down fascist rule making, last week they developed a covenant for themselves. One, members will attend senior youth group as often as they can and are expected to get along with others in their group. Two, there shall be no cliques within the group that make others feel unwelcome. Three, we will be making sure to consider food and snack options for everyone in the group, critical. Four, we will choose and undertake frequent out of the building activities, less planning and lecturing, more doing. The youth group has left the building. Five, we will have fun together and create closer connections. Remember, this sermon is about me being away for three months and then sometime later being away for longer than that. And then, as for all of us, being away really indefinitely. And the point of this sermon is that all of us can face uncertainty by renewing our faith and our covenants. A long time ago, my mentor in ministry gave me a little book titled The Cloud of Unknowing. And it is an anonymously written 14th century Middle English text of Christian mysticism and a spiritual guide. Here are two excerpts from the cloud of unknowing. When you first begin this work, you find only darkness and as it were, a cloud of unknowing. Reconcile yourself to wait in the darkness as long as is necessary, but still go on longing after that which you love. And so I urge you, go after experience rather than knowledge. Was the senior youth group studying the cloud of unknowing? Sounds awfully similar. On account of pride, the cloud of unknowing continues, knowledge may often deceive you, but this gentle, loving affection will not deceive you. Knowledge tends to breed conceit, but love builds. Knowledge is full of labor, but Love is full of rest. 
It is the magical realist story of the Zen master whom the king commissioned to paint a painting. I've told you this story many times before, and I'm sure it's not the last time I'll tell you this story of the king who commissioned a painter to paint a painting. Again and again, the king would ask, is the painting complete? And the master would say, wait a little more. Wait a little more. Years passed, and the king said, it is taking too much time. Is not the painting ready yet? The master said, the painting is ready, but I am watching you. You are not ready. The painting was ready long ago, but that is not the point. Unless you are ready, to whom will I show it? And then it is said that the king became ready, and the painter said, OK, the time has come. And so together they entered the room. Nobody else was allowed in the room. And the painting was astonishingly wonderful. It was difficult even to say that it was a painting. It looked so real. The painter had done a painting of hills and valleys. And they looked almost three-dimensional, as if they existed. And by the hills, there was a small path going somewhere inside. Now comes the most difficult part of this story. The king asked, where does this road lead? The painter said, I have not myself traveled yet on this road, but you wait. I will go and see. And then he entered the path and he disappeared beyond the hills, and he never came back. I hope to be back soon <laughs> and to be with all of you again, inshallah. I love you. All beautiful. The March of Days is our hymn.
and my favorite knock knock joke. Ready? <laughs> knock knock. See you later, suckers. <laughs>